Pastor Ted. Amen. Thank you, Brother Brian. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Hallelujah. I'm glad for every one of you that are here under the sound of the word. Now, you may have noticed we had a different worship leader this morning. You know, just just may have noticed. So we're going to congratulate Jonathan and Shannon on the new entry into their family. Uh, Jonathan and Shannon were blessed with a wonderful daughter on Wednesday this past. And so they had made arrangements already with Pastor David to not have be free of their obligations. But here in church, nevertheless. God bless you guys. Good to see you. Amen. Amen. And then Bruce became a grandpa this week as well. Yesterday, I guess. So there you go. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You going to let him into that fraternity? I think he burst through the door, ready or not. Here he. Oh, praise God. Uh, I want to talk about two things before we get to the message this morning. Number one, my wife is going to begin a class on Tuesday night this coming, like, you know, two days from now. Uh, and it's on what we around here we call soul therapy. Some people have caught, we've been doing it now over 20 years. Some people call it deliverance, call it different things. But we're going to be, she's going to begin a class uh, for, with two purposes in mind on Tuesday night. Uh Number one is to equip some people to continue doing this ministry. It's grown to the point where we have numbers of requests for people from people to, to have this ministry, and she can't cannot do them all. And uh, and so she would she's going to do this class. And if you have an interest in learning this ministry, uh, I'd encourage you to be at my home at seven before seven o'clock on Tuesday evening. Uh, second purpose of this is. If you want to receive this ministry, uh, we'd like for you to come and get some education. Because it's important. When you receive ministry, it's important for you to be able to say amen. What do you mean, Pastor? It means you're going to agree with what's going on. It's not just about saying words and jumping through hoops. It's about engaging the process with the Holy Spirit. And so she's doing that starting this week at our home. And so if you are interested... <coughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, be careful of the front steps on my porch. They need a little concrete work. But if you're wise and take precautions, you'll be fine. Okay? No dancing up and down the steps. Anyway, so that's happening. Now tonight, this young lady that's going to be with us, her name's Kelly Martin, and she has just returned from serving in Australia for the last five years and is now transitioning to an appointment ministry in uh, Great Britain, and she'll be there for a few years, and she's working uh, in discipleship and in helping new believers uh, assimilate the Word of God, and in England, she's going to be working with people who have been converted from Islam through a, an established ministry that's there, but she's going to be with us tonight. I met this young lady maybe two, three months ago, coming to the Green Country Pastors Prayer Meeting that I lead, uh, and uh, I just like her. There's a grace about her life, the Holy Spirit's empowerment to her, and she's got an amazing, terrific testimony. And so I've asked her to come share her testimony and the call of God on her life and how that works. And uh, I invited Chris and the youth to come and hear the story. Guys, we need to hear these stories of how people get from being a regular person in the community working in, to the call of God. God still calls people to ministry. And if you have a call to ministry, you have a call to preparation. Not simply going to Bible school somewhere, but a preparing of yourself as a disciple. If you have a call of God, well, I got the call to preach. No, you got the call to die and learn. And in God's good time, you'll preach. Frequently in the church, we have gotten the uh, cart in front of the horses. And that's why we have hundreds of people weekly dropping out of ministry because they had an emotional or some kind of an experience and yet they were not trained and discipled to know how to live through the hard times. 
Because I don't care what you're doing to serve Jesus, you're going to have some complications and difficulties. And you're going to have to press through those. We want to celebrate uh, Kelly because he was able to step up and do uh, the, the message or at the men's breakfast yesterday when Bruce was busy becoming a grandfather. Because Bruce was scheduled, and, uh, and then Kelly was instant in season. And we appreciate it, Kelly. Thank you. And, uh, and so, but a call in the ministry is a call to preparation. And sometimes you can't know what's going to happen to you when you say yes and you surrender to God. It's not all bad. Don't misunderstand me. It's wonderful. However, just like in life, there's challenges. And every one of us, whether you're, quote, unquote, called into the ministry or whether you just have the call of God to serve in the kingdom, because we all do. We're all called to serve in the kingdom of God. We're all called to serve in the kingdom of God. And so uh, it's a pretty important deal. And uh, anyway, Kelly will be here tonight sharing with us. I'd like to encourage you to come back. Come back to church tonight. We'll start around at 6 o'clock. Usually I'm pretty punctual. If you don't know that about me by now, you haven't been here very long. I'm, I'm pretty much about, uh, I don't want to say I'm obsessive compulsive, but we start on time. <laughs> anyway, we'll begin at 6 o'clock and do some preliminary things. And then uh, uh, one of the things we do on Sunday nights, we like to share praise reports and testimonies. Not only of what God has done for you, but how God has worked through you in the previous week or in previous time. So uh, I just want to encourage you to be here tonight to hear Kelly. And then once again, on Tuesday night, uh, Ms. Jenny is going to be teaching a class, a preparatory class on soul therapy. Why do you call it soul therapy, Pastor? Well, we've called it a lot of things over the years, trying to figure out exactly what it is. But really, it is... Do you know what sanctification is? Sanctification means to be set apart. It's to be set apart. New Testament's word is hagios. It means holy. You're a holy set apart unto God. It's not so much about getting rid of your personal sin, but if you pursue God, that stuff will fall off of you. That's why you don't hear me pick on personal sins. I don't preach a lot about sin in this church. I'm not going to today. I'm going to talk about grace. But because if you set your heart to pursue God, he'll talk to you about these other things. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the power. He'll give you the authority to set aside anything that comes between you and him and his purposes. And the thing is, in church life sometimes, it seems like the more we commit to the purposes of God, the, the erroneous, false doctrine that's been taught by, by it's been taught Spoken and unspoken is that if you really commit to serve God, all you're going to have is a life of sadness and suffering. That's just not true. It's a lie. Now, I used to think as a pastor, you had more tribulations than everybody else. Then I began to minister to some folks who were professionals, fairly significant professionals in our culture, and I found out they live through the same stuff. And uh, and really, sometimes they don't really know the Lord who is a helper in the midst of those things, you know. And so, uh, so anyway, those two things, those things are happening. By the way, this is Lenten season for all of you high church people. And so every Wednesday at lunchtime, uh, there's a, a worship experience happening at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in town, and uh, all the various pastors in town are share a devotional, and then their church prepares a lunch, and everybody comes. And so, you know, it's 75 to 100 people, sometimes 35 to 50 people. But every day until we get to uh, the week before uh, Easter, and, uh, and then, uh, but we're doing it. So, Life Changer, we are doing that service on the last Wednesday of March. I believe it's the 27th, if, I'm, if my image of the, my calendar is correct in my head. It's the 27th, I believe, but it's that last Wednesday of March, and so we'll be doing that. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're free in the middle of the day, or you can take an hour, it's really worth it. You get to hear a variety of the pastors in our city uh, have a devotional thought or uh, sing a song or two together, worship some together, and then a lunch is provided for two or three bucks. And so we'll be doing that at the end of the month. And so... Uh, 
There you go. Those are all the announcements I can think of that seem to be things that Pastor needed to talk about. And so, if you'd open your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of Ephesians. To the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that was in Ephesus. Now, the church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesus was a huge city in the beginning of the church age. Paul had evangelized, he'd come through, and as always, Paul always went to the synagogue, and he would begin to preach Jesus. Really, what he preached was the kingdom of God. I find it so fascinating. The older I get, and the longer I serve God in ministry, the more I wonder how we got to where we are sometimes. Because Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is near, and he sent the 12 out to preach the same thing, and he sent them out to preach this thing and then demonstrate that it's true by healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead, doing these miraculous signs and wonders, and, and touching people's hearts. You know, he, didn't, he, he did not send the 12 out to say, look, guys, you're sinners, and you're going to go to hell if you don't receive the king. That was not the message of the first century. The expectation in the first century was not that you will pray a prayer, live your life however you want to, and then when you die, you get to go to heaven. That was not the message that Jesus preached. It was not the message in the book of Acts. It was, it's not any pre You can't find a message like that in the New Testament. Ideas when you 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 change kingdoms, you change lords, you change who you're following. Sometimes we're following self. I'm preaching better than y'all are. Amen. Sometimes you know in life, you don't have to be taught to be selfish. All of us have raised kids. We know what well, some of the first lines they ever learned to say was, it's mine. And then we watched little two-year-olds toddling around, jerking a toy away from another two-year-old. It's mine. You know, you don't teach people to be selfish. We're born in sin, you guys. We're born uh, wanting to take care of number one. We are not born trusting. We are born not trusting. Okay? And so... It's like the thing that Miss Jenny's going to be teaching this coming week. Listen, guys, I don't care how much deliverance you've had. If you don't follow deliverance with discipleship, with a desire to follow Jesus and allow the desire to follow Jesus to speak into every facet of your life. If you're a Jesus follower, it speaks to marriage. If you're a Jesus follower, it speaks to parenting. If you're a Jesus follower, it speaks to how you conduct business. If you're a Jesus follower, it is a voice that speaks into every part of your life. As multifaceted as God is and as multifaceted as each one of you, every facet of God matches a facet of you. You can't find a part of your life that God doesn't want to speak into. That God's word doesn't address in some form or fashion or the other. The Lord has never left us lacking concerning his provision in our lives, whatever that area is. Now, I've got to tell you, for you to be able to embrace that, you've got to be in a place where we talk about that. Not all churches talk about this. Some churches talk about Receiving Jesus so that you can go to heaven. But you know what? The kingdom of God was sent into the earth. Jesus was sent into the earth to bring heaven into the earth. Not so that somehow he got to go to heaven after the cross. So that when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life by grace and faith, that you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and life, that heaven then through your life, 
will be manifested and demonstrated in day-to-day -day living. And not just on Sundays. We love it on Sundays. But not just on Sundays. But in day-to-day -day living. I don't know about you, but I've had the Holy Spirit arrest me in the middle of my life in my functioning and my parenting and husbanding and, and other things that I do, my work in the church, how I relate to the secretaries, how I relate to other volunteer leaders, how I do those things. The Holy Spirit's been known to uh, get my attention and have asked me to make some adjustments. I trust he also feels free to speak to you both through his word and by his spirit. If God's going to talk to you in the spiritual realm, he's going to speak to you through the word of God, and he's going to speak to you by the spirit of God. Holy Spirit's going to resonate something on the inside of you that you know he's talking to you about something. Now, early on in ministry, uh, you know, y'all, I felt guilty like I'd failed God or something. Until I realized God's just fine-tuning. He's trying to help me. And I have to admit to you, I need a lot of help. And if you sit there and tell me you don't need help, I think you might lie about other things. We need God. We need the Lord. We need the Lord's assistance. We need the Lord's encouragement. We need the Lord's rebuke. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Well, I want to serve God. I don't want my relationship with God to be an afterthought to what I do in my life. I just think we've made serving God too hard. But surrender doesn't come easy. You know, can you imagine what Jesus was going through in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord, knowing that he was facing a Roman crucifixion? And the guys in those days, they understood what that meant. They saw these things regularly happen out there on the skull, out on the hill. The citizens of Jerusalem knew what a Roman crucifixion was. The citizens of Israel knew the horror of it. They knew the pain of it. They knew the destruction of it. That's why it's so remarkable that Jesus could say, Lord, if there's any way to get around this cup right here, if there's any way, but, but, not my will, but thy will be done. I think it's a big deal. Easter's a big deal. What Jesus endured, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, can you imagine Jesus looking through history, seeing you, and seeing me, 2,000 years away, and for the redemption that he knew was going to be purchased for you and me, he endured the cross. And friends, he could have called legions of angels at any time, and they would have taken him off that cross. They were at his disposal anywhere in the process. It's amazing. I think it's just amazing. Did you find Ephesians? You thought I forgot. It's a very famous passage of Scripture. I'm sure you probably have it memorized. You're familiar with it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, uh, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good, well, actually for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you know God has prepared a way for you to walk ahead of you? God has prepared a place and a way for you to walk. Good works, works of service, works of kindness. God's prepared some things for you to... And so part of our journey as disciples of Jesus Christ is to find out where we fit and what that looks like and walk there and grow while we're walking there. 
You cannot serve God in a local church through a parachurch ministry in any way without any, forcing you to face some things for you to grow into more of Jesus. Can't do it. It's not possible. Why is that, Pastor? Because you work with other people. And no matter how holy we are, some of us can get to where we provoke you. And then sometimes out of your own insecurities and fears, you get provoked and we did nothing. We were innocent. You took it wrong. You interpreted it wrong. You interpreted it through the lens of your pain and your disappointment and your own insecurity and became offended over something somebody didn't do. Let me just say, has anyone ever been offended over something that didn't happen? Raise your hand. We can smile about it when we look back at it. But when we're in the middle of it, it's not a happy time. You know, I've even been offended on behalf of people. It didn't even concern me. I just got mad at the other person because I thought they had done something untoward towards somebody else. And it didn't, even, it didn't even affect me. I just got mad on their behalf. I got offended for them. Matter of fact, when I've done that, the other people get well a lot quicker than I do. You ever notice that? You get friends and they get in a controversy, and man, you can take one side or the other and just get all jacked up. You know that theological term? You get all, you know, and then they make up and they're going along doing fine and you're still in the junk. God is so good to us. So I uh, read this verse for you here. For by grace you've been saved. So I began to look for a definition of grace. You know, uh, you know some of the popular ones. God's favor. You know, uh, God likes me even when I'm bad. There's some popular ones out there about grace. But as I began to dig into grace, I'm going to give you Pastor Ted's working definition of grace. So what does that mean? It's a working definition. That means it's in process. Grace, the gift of the favor of God that transforms. For instance, if you've come and prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and you've had no change, you have not received grace. Just praying the prayer and jumping through the hoop doesn't mean you got it. What's it? Him. Because when you receive, by faith, the grace of God, it transforms. It starts a process of changing you, of molding you, and he gets in the dance with you. Sometimes it's an image that I have. I'm not a dancer, but one of the images I have about this is when you receive Jesus Christ, you invite him into the dance of your life. He becomes your dance partner. He's moving with you. He's, he's, he's connected to you. You're in some kind of rhythm together. And you're learning to yield to his leadership. And you're learning to, to receive his leadership. You're learning those lessons of surrender and yet safety. One of the reasons we're afraid to surrender to God is we're afraid of what's going to happen. I mean, it really is true. And, and because we've been taught wrong, because we have believed the lie, and the lie is if you surrender to God, he'll make you do what you want to do, go where you don't want to go, and be who you're not. And that's a lie. That's a lie. He's the one who gave you your gifts. He's the one who gave you your, 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 your inclinations or your demeanor toward this, that, or the other. He's the one who is the author of your life. He is the one who is the, 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 the consummate dance partner. I mean, he really is. He's the one who knows who can do public speaking and who can't. He's the one who knows how to serve and gave you a desire to be a helper and a servant. He's the one who does these things. And he will cause your gifts and your graces to flourish if you'll let him. So here it is again. Grace. The gift 
a favor with God that transforms your life. And once again, if you've said a prayer to receive Jesus, ask Jesus into your heart, but no transformation took place, then, then I don't think you've pressed through yet. Now, the other thing I want to point out to the Scripture is, is that uh, by grace you have been saved, by the favor of God, by the divine impetus of God, that you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. Listen, you can't pull off salvation on your own. I don't care how religious you are. You cannot make yourself get saved. You cannot yourself do it. And you certainly can't do it through good works. And too many Christians in our world believe that being a Christian is about doing these good things. Well, we need to do good things, but it's not how we get saved. That's so that we can't compare ourselves. I did it better than you. So many times, the way we want to exalt ourselves or impress ourselves is by putting someone else down. So many times, one of the ways we help ourselves feel good about ourselves is by somehow talking better about us and lesser about somebody else. Comparing us, Paul says that we should not compare ourselves among ourselves. It is not wise. Well, I'm a better Christian than them. That just means you've got a bigger pile of things you call good than they do, that you can see. But God sees all. And our interaction with God, our interaction with God is based on his grace or favor in our life and our response to that, that brings transformation. I am glad that God is like the hound of heaven. Yet even when I am faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is a faithful God. And when I'm a knucklehead, God is a faithful God. When I'm in doubt and fear and unbelief, God is a faithful God. He stands ready to receive me. His grace is ready to receive me when I turn my heart and my mind from the distractions of this world to the kingdom of our God. He'll receive me back to himself. I think it's pretty amazing. Now let me show you something that Paul wrote to the Roman church. So it's in Romans. Uh, let me see. Chapter 10. Kenny will get it up on the screen. But listen, don't get into the habit of leaving your Bible at home. You know, we have them electronically. We have them on our phones. We have them on our iPads. That's fine. But, but keep your Bible cl close. In Romans 10, uh, this is a very interesting passage of Scripture. It says, uh, verse 8, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here are the elements of grace and faith. You believe in your heart something God has said, and you believe it's true, you believe it applies to you. You believe it. You believe it. You believe it. You believe it. But it's activated when you say it. There is some kind of a spiritual connection between what you believe in your heart and what your mouth declares unto reality. That's why it's important, not just what we believe, but what we say about what we believe. This is how you get saved. 
This is how you come to Christ. You believe a word that's preached, shared, in a tract, how, whatever the modality is, you be, read it, you expose, you hear it, you, you begin, something stirs, and you begin to believe it. So you believe in your heart, and then you confess with your mouth. And that's when salvation happens. That's when grace is activated. Now listen, guys, I want to tell you that's how the kingdom works. Now this may appear to be a, a, a rabbit trail, but it's not a rabbit trail. This is how the kingdom of God works. This is how the kingdom of God works. That you believe in your heart something, but then you begin to say the thing, the something, you begin to say it with your mouth. Believe in your heart, say it with your mouth. I know there's people who have spent years and years teaching, and some are really wonderful teachings that talk about, you know, confession and Guarding your words, because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those things are important, but I think that when you become a legalist about anything in the kingdom of God or in the word of God, you've gone a bridge too far. You've gone, you've gone into a good thing to an extreme that brings you back to not being in a relationship with God, but doing good works. But you can't discount the reality of the fact that what you say matters. And what you say about what you believe matters. Now, i got to tell you something. I thought belief and believing God about something was about emotions. That I couldn't know whether I was in faith or not unless I felt it. But let me tell you something about emotions. They just are. You got them. And when they're disciplined and trained, they're wonderful. But when you let your emotions guide the choices of your life, you're going to wind up in a fix. But this is how the kingdom works. You hear something preached. You read it in the Bible. A word comes to you by the Spirit. You hear it, you hear it, you hear it. And if you're going to receive it, you're going to say it. It's just how it works. Now, and you're going to learn. And you're going to learn that you go to extremes. Has anybody been on the pendulum that went to one side and then it went to the other side? And, and, and you don't know how you didn't fall off on either side, but, you know, and then sooner or later it kind of works its way down to a place of maturity. You know what mature means? It means you're not given to every wind of doctrine. That's from Ephesians 4. You're not given to every threat. So while we're here, can I say something about the virus that everybody's in a brouhaha about? I think it's got real threats. But I've read the fine print. I've read the research. This is no worse than the flu. More people die from the common flu in the United States in a year than this thing, this virus has even gotten anywhere near. That doesn't mean it won't spread. I'm not, I don't want to discount it. But listen, wash your hands. You know, if you're in a crowd and you're shaking a bunch of hands with somebody, go wash your hands. And washing your hands doesn't mean rinse them with cold water and find a paper towel. I started to, I thought today as I was thinking about this, I thought maybe I should have one of our medical professionals get up here and show you how to do hand washing. I might do it yet, but you wash your hands, and you wash them, you scrub them, you use soap, you take 90 seconds to wash your hands. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask if you can find one to buy anywhere. Now, we're in the middle here. I think there's been one case in Tulsa that's showed up in the news this week or something, and so... If you have fragile health or something, just pay attention to where you're going and what you're doing. Here's what I'm going to... You guys on the camera back there? Don't let fear torment you. 
I'll set this aside. Don't let fear torment you. Don't let fear torment you. Trust God. Be wise. Trust God. Or trust God. Be wise. I mean, 40 years ago when I was doing hospital training, the number one cause of problems in the hospitals caused nosocomial infections. And mostly that happened because people don't wash their hands. And they go from patient to patient, doctor to patient, nurse to patient, chaplain to patient. You know, I've had somebody stand over me and watch me wash my hands to make sure I know how to do it. It's part of my training. You're going to know how to wash your hands before you get out of here. Now, don't make me get a basin at the door. <laughs> we don't have to live in fear, nor do we have to live with obsession. You know, if you're washing your hands for 20 minutes, we're not doing heart surgery here. Don't allow a fear to drive you to obsessive behavior in any arena. That's not living free. That's not living free. So by grace, we're saved through faith, not of ourselves. Have you read the scripture that says no man comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him? Which brings me to this. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about something, can I give you some counsel? Do not harden your heart. Don't resist God. Don't think you know better. Everybody say, yes, Pastor Ted. See, you can harden your heart so that the Holy Spirit will not do, deal with you. I don't want to harden my heart to God. Say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer, Pastor. It, you know, it never happened to me. I know a lot of Christians who've hardened their heart to the Holy Spirit. Some of you in this room, don't harden your heart to God. It's usually when God asks us to do something we're either afraid of or we're, we're uh, afraid of is probably covers everything, or we're resistant to. And so it's better to obey. It's better to just surrender to the Lord. Even if you have to say something like, Lord, I'm nervous about this, and I don't know whether I can trust you with it or not. Honesty with God will get you down the road. So, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In Romans 10, same chapter, in verse 14, it says this, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, I could read on, but I won't. The point is, we need to hear the word. We need to hear it preached. We need to hear it taught. We need to read it ourselves. Sometimes you just need to read it out loud. Have you learned that? Sometimes we just read and we've been taught to read silently, but every once in a while you just need to read the Bible out loud. Your ears need to hear what your mouth is saying that's in the book. I heard a preacher say this one time, and I really believe it's true. The word was spoken so it could be written, and it was been written so it could be spoken. And it's important that we, you know, two weeks ago I talked about the one thing in my message was read your Bible. And then last week, Pastor Travis brought us an incredible word about the word, various facets and aspects of it. What was its return on investment? You know, it, it could, you could almost think of it as selfishness. If you read the Bible with a view to obey the Bible, it's better for you. It's, I mean, I suppose if you, if you, 
if you just got to be selfish about something, obey God because it's better for you. Read the Bible. It's better for you. Surrender to God. It's better for you. That changed my life when I saw that. For all, half my life, I struggled with being obedient to the word of the Lord just because I think I was had some, I didn't know God really loved me. I knew it in my head. I read the book. I knew the facts. But I didn't believe it in my heart because I was resisting him. See, what you believe in your heart will come out of your mouth. What you believe in your heart will inform your behaviors. What you believe in your heart will inform your decisions. What you believe in your heart really matters. And if you see yourself making crummy decisions, you see yourself um, <coughs> drifting off into things you don't need to be drifting off into, and you're aware enough to know that this is not good. This is not good for my family. This is not good for me. This is not good for the local church. This is not good. And you realize that, then you have to, you have to come to a place where you, you, you own it. Say, Lord Jesus, I need your help. And then buckle your seatbelt. If you pray to the Lord God Almighty and you ask him for help, he will answer your prayer. And so you sometimes you got to buckle up, baby. Because sometimes when he answers your prayer, he'll take you to a place you didn't know you wanted to go. But it's, it all turns out good. While you may have emotion in that moment, you may have fear in that moment, if you're committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ, it will turn out good for you and yours. You know that song Pastor David led us in earlier, nothing's impossible with God. I don't care how bad it looks. I had the sense as we were singing that this morning, there's, there's two or three families in here today that need to know. I don't care how long it's been going on. I don't care what the situation is. Nothing. Absolutely nothing is impossible with God. And I followed it up with the song, even when you can't see it, God's working. I would say it this way. Even when you can't see it, if you continue to believe and speak, God's working. Even when you don't feel it, God's working. Yes, he is. So we're going to talk about grace for a few weeks. Uh, and, uh, and here's my working definition. Grace is the gift of the favor of God. The favor with God that brings transformation. If I need something to change in my life, my prayer should be, Lord, Lord, would you give me grace? The kind of grace that embodies who you are as you come into my heart and bring transformation. You ever need change? I do. And when I do, I need grace. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now. I know you've been present with us, Lord. I'm grateful. But come in your mighty power in this moment. Altar ministers, while I'm praying, please make your way to the front. Holy Spirit, come. Come. You know, uh, somebody asked me not, not very long ago, Pastor, what's this prayer about? Holy Spirit, come. Where'd that come from? Well, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, you being uh, mere mortals and evil that you are would give good gifts to your kids. How much more will God give you the Holy Spirit when you ask? So, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. I ask you to come. I know you have been here hovering about.